So fundraising, I'm making a pitch here. This uh, fund script, I don't know how many of you are, are part of the small group that's already uh, into it, but uh, uh, Anne-Marie has, has given a very detailed description of, of how to do it, and if, if, you don't, if you don't feel like doing it, uh, but are interested in uh, participating, she's very happy to take your order. The way it works is you just simply uh, purchase from Fundscript, this program, uh, a card. Say you, f you shop at uh, Independent or you shop at Freshco or someplace like that. You always do a grocery shopping, right? You buy food. There are lots of places in our culture that define us not so much as citizens, but as consumers. I mean, that's our job in the, in the economy, right? <laughs> to buy stuff and to, you know, to take our money and put it into the economy. So this simply leverages that reality. You're already doing it. You're buying, you're buying groceries, you're buying gas. I'm pretty sure you're doing that. And then you're buying books, you're buying, uh, you know, you're going to the restaurants, you're, you're doing all kinds of things uh, with your money. And what happens is when you use this little card, it's just like cash. Uh, and a percentage of what you purchase uh, goes to the church, whoever you're fundraising for. So it's a very nifty way to raise funds Without, without doing anything different except ordering a card that you, that you then use to purchase your, your things. I, you know, it is a challenge to, to get it into your life as a routine and as a, you know, something that you do um, uh, at certain times in order to be able to have money in your account to cover the, the card. But once you get that under control and just do it as a regular thing, it's just a regular small donation to the church, but if everybody's doing it, it accumulates. And it's, it's, you know, we are at a point in our congregation where we, we just need those little, those little inputs, those little spurts of, um, of generosity that, can, that are possible. So I urge you to become involved in the Fundscript uh, campaign. So enough of all of that. Um, I will be in touch with you. I'm looking for the, the this light, the Christ candle, which um, actually, oh, we have a little candle going. You know, I'm going to let that be the candle because this is this needs a new. Um... So here we have a beautiful. Oh, this is. Not a live play at best. Great! It's one of these artificial ones. But I acknowledge it as a, a candle, a light, a flame. Um, and it does look alive, doesn't it? Oh my goodness. The light uh, of the candle is a symbol of God's presence. And this is something that we, we need to be encouraged to become aware of all the time in our lives. God, as God is present within us, deep within us, in places where we're, we may not even be conscious, but God is there. God between us, and God in the entire universe holding everything together. The more we're learning, the more amazing it is, um, and uh, for this we're very grateful. And we acknowledge that that presence has been known for millennia. It, it has been known by the people that occupied and cared for this land long before our ancestors arrived. And I, I gather there are no indigenous people here. The indigenous people of our land. Um, and those people we count, uh, we count, among those people, we count the First Nations across the country, different languages, different cultures, they were here before us. Um, the, the Inuit uh, in the northern parts, reaching over and uh, connecting with other indigenous people across the land and uh, across the north into Russia and uh, all those Scandinavian countries. 
and the Métis. Very interesting, the Métis, because, um, you know, they, they are the offspring of, of uh, explorers, traders that came here 500, 600 years ago, um, and then um, married um, indigenous women, and then uh, they became unto themselves a, a people, a, a people strongly connected with their indigenous ancestry. So, um, and we have we have some uh, uh, indigenous, uh, some Métis people that are members of our um, our charge. So I'm very aware of that. Uh, we are committed as a church and as a, as small communities to continuing to work to build relationships that are just and equitable for us all. And I urge you, if you if you have a chance to get to know some people in our in our community that are um, uh, self-identify as uh, First Nations or Métis, uh, please make, take the opportunity to get to know them. So um, let's call, we have, you have a bulletin here. Let's call one another into worship. I'll say the light text and then you will get, uh, say the, the bold text. Come, let us gather to hear the evolving story of God's love. In this sacred space, we give ourselves to the present moment, laying aside all worries and concerns, entering into the now of the great I am, God's active and eternal presence. Amen. Last Sunday, we had the story of uh, Moses and the burning bush and God declaring uh, God's name as uh, I am, which is a great mystery, powerful mystery. So uh, we're going to sing an opening hymn, Come Let Us Sing to the Lord Our Song, Voices United 222, and Cynthia will lead us. Let's stand. Come, let us sing to the respond we come with hope and expectation we bring our hearts desire we come with the longing in our souls we bring our hunger for life we come seeking God's wisdom we bring all our questions and our doubts we bring all our hopes and our dreams Holy Spirit, you hear our sighs and longings, the sadness that weighs us down when our lives are heavy and the world is in pain. Inspire us by the delights of your creation. Lift up our hearts like the wind in the trees, the birds that soar, the hills and the horizon. 
In the name of Jesus, our wisdom and our way. Amen. And I forgot to ask for somebody to read. This is the story of, um, of the first Passover. Would somebody be a reader for, for me? For us? Okay. Thank you. Uh, with all the changes, I just completely forgot my routine. <laughs> Scripture is a living word, passed on from generation to generation. May it guide and inspire us so that we might wrestle a holy revelation from it for our own time and our own place. Amen. Today we hear a reading from Exodus 12, 1 through 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, and the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its heads, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly, it is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Sometimes it's hard to thank God for stories that are difficult to hear. Um, I, I'm not, I'll say something later about those difficulties, but right now we're going to... I had an image when I first read that uh, passage again um, of, the, of the Hebrew slaves, you know, they're, they're leaving. They, they, they are leaving town. They are in a, in a procession and they are leaving. And there's a wail that is going up around them because... The firstborn in every household has been has been has died. Uh, everyone except them, and they're 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 trying to get out there as um, as fast as they can. And I just saw a, a mother standing in a household, watching as the Hebrew slaves left, uh, going to their freedom and their liberation. And for them, it's a good story, but. You know, the woman is weeping because her child is dead. So we live in a world where, and it says, the text says that, that, that God made this happen. I think God weeps when things like that happen. So anyway, this is a hymn called God Weeps. More Voices, 78, and I'd like you to remain seated. It's not a joyous, triumphant uh, uh, hymn. It's a hymn to enable us to reflect on what we've just heard. <laughs>
So when I had to send everything to um, to uh, Linda, who prints out the bulletin and 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 uh, puts up the um, the full service text on our website, um, I uh, <laughs> I wasn't ready at all, at all, because I found the text so troubling. Uh, and I just didn't know what I was going to say. I knew it had some connection with that God weeps. Um, I knew it had some connection with with sorrow at the same time as joy, because slavery is no no you know is something you want to escape from, and uh, tyranny is the same all over the world, and uh, there are those that benefit by it and those that suffer from it, and that's the world we live in. This story about the lamb and about the, uh, the, the blood of the lamb is absolutely fundamental to what most of us have been taught, the, the, the teaching in uh, the, the New Testament uh, letters and books about it. Basically, we get our image of the Lamb of God, Jesus, on the cross, um, and uh, dying, and his blood flowing, and uh, we are given the image of being saved by that blood. And it's taken right out of, of this story of the Hebrew slaves being saved being liberated out of Egypt, but uh, the, the angel of death passes over and uh, there is great sorrow and, and wailing, uh, great tragedy in the land. You know, I'm a United Church convert. You've heard me say that many times. I rediscovered my faith and my relationship with God through some of the incredibly deep and profound work that's been done by this denomination, the United Church of Canada, ever since its difficult beginnings, which I, 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 I preached about uh, recently, I began exploring what it might mean to become a minister in the United Church of Canada, and as a part of that, I became a lay presbytery rep, and I attended Toronto Conference, for the first time with my friend, Reverend Nina Fulford. She, she also was a member of Trinity United and became a United Church minister, um, a second career at the end of her um, uh, uh, professional life. And uh, she's still going. <laughs> uh, music leadership at this conference was being provided by a wonderful music combo. We had guitars and drums and keyboards and, you know, it was, uh, it was all um, uh, very uh, exciting, but suddenly I found myself singing a song that I remembered from, uh, from my background, my evangelical background, 
Uh, it was a song about being saved by the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, and full of gratitude for his death. And I leaned over to Nina and I whispered, I'm going through an identity crisis. And without skipping a beat, she leaned right back, she's done her work, <laughs> and whispered, just remember, Meg, blood means life. Blood means life. And, you know, I went, oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, blood means life. And we know that, you know, we give blood. Uh, blood is what enables us to live. Um, and, you know, we're born in a womb where we share our mother's blood through the placenta. I mean, we know blood means life. So that helped me. Some traditions of the Christian church emphasize this parallel between the Passover event spoken of in our scripture today and the meaning of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Some biblical scholars think that through the telling of stories and the making of meaning out of the shock of the senseless cruelty of Jesus' death, that the, the early Christians began to make connections with the Passover story and just as the blood of the unblemished lamb spread on the doorposts and on the lintels, which is the, uh, up above the door of uh, the threshold to Israel's homes, allowed for the firstborn to be spared uh, the tenth and final plague, so too does the blood of Christ shed on the cross help those who believe in him to pass through the plague of the earthly consequences of our sins and go into what we call eternity and life with God. Combine that with the denial of the sacred, which has gone hand in hand with the emergence of modern science, the sacred, sacred nature, the, the, the sacred presence of God everywhere, that combined with modern science and capitalism and the denial of the loss of the sacred in our human, in our human dealings with, with the earth and one another, you basically have a recipe for what is becoming, unfortunately, a brutal world where sacrifice is something that is imposed on others rather than given by the self. Violence against one another and the whole earth is where we come from, that's our history. But the violence of the sacrifice of another does not bring redemption. What we've learned about from the seed, which Jesus used as an image to, to explain his death, and the supernova, which is the, the, the star which bursts uh, and dies and gives out all, all the, the parts of, of its life. And out of that come the elements out of which we, uh, the earth is formed and we are formed. That sacrifice is redemptive and it's life-giving only when freely chosen. And, and that's why we can say that Jesus' death is redemptive, but it's because he chose to allow that to happen to himself. This is why we continue to hold. We are, you know, we're, we're coming up to uh, November the 11th and we're, we're, we're coming up to celebrating the sacrifices uh, and, and we're filled with gratitude for the sacrifices of those who place themselves in harm's way for the sake of others. Those who willingly accepted death as part of their desire for life. We see this happening in our day. Blood does mean life. And we are part of a community where we need to make a distinction. We need desperately to make a distinction between sacred stories about redemptive violence. The violence, the killing of Jesus was redemptive. It enables us to be saved. Um, that redemptive violence uh, versus sacred stories about life emerging out of death. And of course, in the story of Jesus, we have both. 
we have is dying, and we had, have a, a story of, of, of resurrection. We have many sacred stories uh, where God does something ghastly, like, like killing all the firstborn uh, of Egypt in order to liberate the Hebrew people. And I can think of uh, all kinds of other uh, instances in the, in the Hebrew scriptures. And, and, and God is, we're told, causes the execution of Jesus in order to save us from God's righteous wrath. Blood means life. And we have a lot of work to do together to find meaning in the living word of our sacred stories. You know, when we read that, we say scripture is a living word. We have work to do. We need to enter into that wrestling. And that's what I have done most of, um, most of this week. Uh, and I invite you to join me in asking questions of the text, letting your doubts and your, your you know, yeah, that sound doesn't sound like the God I know and have been have learned about. Um, a story to tell you, my, um, my daughter, when she was about four or five, uh, we were having a family time and, <clears throat> and uh, she, she asked us to read her a story and my husband uh, said, would you like to hear a Bible story? <laughs> uh, we happen to have a Bible story book, a children's book. Um, and uh, she said, yeah, yeah. So he sat down, she jumped on his knee, and they, uh, they looked through, and she chose the, 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 the story that had frogs in it and, you know, things like that, and illustrations, and it was about these plagues in Egypt. And then it came to the point in the story where we hear about the killing of the firstborn. And she literally took her little hand, little four-year-old hand, and put it right on the book and said, God wouldn't do that. Because her little heart knew, and her, that little place inside of her, which had been nurtured, admittedly, and, and nurtured and cultivated by us about a God of love, about the God that Jesus taught about, about Jesus and how he, he lived a life and lived God's way and all, you know, all, all the stories that we tell, and, and a God of love. And she just knew right away, God wouldn't do that. Most of us have that gut reaction too. The way the story gets told, it's, it's an act of God. Well, we have that in our insurance policies, right? Uh, there are certain things that God does that we call an act of God, and they're all horrible things, you know, like earthquakes and uh, floods and all those kinds of things. They're, they're acts of God, and insurance companies do not take responsibility for those. So um, we, we the, the stories of God act God's actions and God being the the one that makes terrible things happen uh, is uh, is very much a part of our ongoing life whether we believe in God or not. So I invite you during this season of creation to join me in asking questions because. This is what will lead us forward into living out of the wholeness for which we believe we are called. Despite the teachings that we've received, uh, we are on a quest. That's what the word question is all about. We ask questions. They lead us forward into discoveries, into new life, into wholeness. And uh, I truly believe that. So... I'll be asking more questions, and if you have questions, please, please um, uh, ask them and, and let me know what you're asking, and uh, we will just move forward together. So we have um, uh, a uh, we have a basket for uh, a plate for offering. Do we? Oh, there's uh, under there. 
Um, so we're, we're kind of trying out all kinds of different things with the offering. Um, but we, uh, we call for an offering right now. And if you, um, I, I, uh, I want you to realize, first of all, it's in the, in the bulletin. Anyway, there are lots of different ways to give. If any of you have um, uh, have come with an offering, great. Um, Vina and uh, <laughs> and and uh, Wayne will uh, take up the offering, and then um, some of you have envelopes. Others give by par, um, but this is also a symbol for the offering of our lives. Uh, our 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 giving of our lives to this quest of, of relationship with God and living the wholeness that God calls for. So let's uh, have the offertory hymn. <laughs> God, all that we have comes from you. We give you thanks, and we offer our lives and these donations, these gifts, as a part of our desire to be a part of your work in the world and your work right here in the village of Dorset and surrounding area. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, I invite you to <coughs> enter into a time of prayer with me. Loving God, we give you thanks for every goodness in our lives and celebrate your presence within and around us. Thank you for the freedoms we share and the opportunities that lie before us. We give thanks for this amazing universe you have created and continue to create. We give thanks for the life of Jesus, who reconciles and makes everything new. And most of all, we give you thanks for working within us and others by your spirit. Help us to put our whole trust in you. Hear now our prayers for ourselves and our world, that they may be not only sounds on our lips, but actions that make a difference. We pray for an end to violence in our homes, in our communities, and between the nations of our beloved Earth. We pray for our planet Earth, and for all those who are acting with respect on her behalf. May their actions be fruitful in bringing wholeness to your creation. And may we, in this community, find ways to work together for the healing of our beloved home. We pray for all who are struggling with their lives, to proclaim your way, your way of peace, resisting evil and promoting justice, all whom we know about and those who struggle on silently without our knowledge. We pray for those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, for those who mourn and those who are facing death. Surround each one with your loving care now as we name them within our hearts in the presence of this community and when we don't.
Fill us, O oh God, with such an assurance of your love and your presence that we may be able to face whatever befalls us, knowing that in life and in death and in life beyond death, you are always with us. And may these words form the ground out of which all our actions grow. Amen. We have a closing hymn, and it is um, it's a hymn about the the actions and the activity of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. <coughs> Spirit dancing. Voices United 388. This was introduced to us by one of our pulpit supply ministers, um, Jane Hapseva. And I have, um, I, I like it so much, uh, we're going to sing it today, and then we're going to sing it uh, next week, because there is reference here to the dancer's art, and um, we're, we're going to have some circle dancing, and we also are going to have a story about a dance as a way to celebrate. So, spirit dancing on the waters, let's stand and sing. Spirit dancing on the waters, sun reflecting, song of grace, calling life to all the creatures, giving life to human race. In spirit dancing on the waters, naming moments they should part, giving freedom to the peoples, sign for all in dancers' art. Spirit dancing on the waters, paradox and woman grace, welcome now. Holy One enfold you. May the labor of the birthing one deliver you, and may the wisdom of the wild one sustain you, and may the peace of the all-in-one sustain you, bless you, and guide you home. Amen. And I'm sorry, but I do have to run. <laughs> yes, you do.